Hi, I'm Lise Gucci, and I'm one of the Lice. <laughs> Let me start that all over again. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lise Colucci, and I'm one of the life coaches at queenbeing.com, where we help you to discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. Hello, and welcome, Jeep and Gypsy, Shastina, Cat Dan, and everyone else who has joined me already today. Um, if you need help with narcissistic abuse recovery or any information, head over to queenbeing.com. Lots of info over there. Hi, Stacy. Um, and we're going to get started talking today about basically about isolation after abuse and also about when trying to relate to others and how to ensure that you're not, um, that you're being heard without how to, how to engage with people and feel like you're being heard without either enabling or being mean. So I'll read the question that someone had later and we'll go into that. So um, you're struggling terrible. Hi, Darla. My depression and anxiety are absolute worse. What's going on, Darla? We'll talk to you about that too. And Arrow Girl and Katie. Hello, hello, everybody. Okay, so um, if you want texting notifications of my going live, Text me at 33222. Put the word as one word, Lease Live, L I S E L I V E, hit send, and I'll text you about 10 minutes prior to going live every time. I'm on here, I try to be four times a week. I've been off the past couple of weeks, but we'll get back to it. So um, there's that. And if you need any help with anything, as I said, head over to Queen Being. If you need help, if you want coaching information for, uh, Individual coaching, again, there's still a special running for 35% off one-on-one -on -one for the next month here. So if you need that, head over to queenbeing.com as well. Information's all in the main description of every video. And also group coaching, know that that's available. And it is also in the main description of every video. There are two groups and there is a trauma bond group starting. So there's that separate from the other group. So we'll just get going. We can talk about that later. If you have any questions, anytime, hit me up. You can reach me on email that's in the description or you can reach me here just in any comment i will find it and reply okay so um hi life's a journey and christy you're not sure darla lots of triggers i feel like um suspended in air my life feels like it's in limbo so you feel stuck right stuck and kind of anxious and depressed what are you doing for the anxiety we'll get to the topic in a second darla's important and right here. <laughs> what are you doing to help with the anxiety and depression? How are you taking care of yourself? And what are you doing for self care for moving that anxiety through your body and out anxiety just I feel like it just sits in me like a ball of energy. And if I don't do something physical, then it just gets worse or something to clear my mind meditation um, relaxation techniques, things like that. Um, a lot of times that only works after I move around a bit. So I don't know about you, but that's something, uh, I slept 15 hours the other day. I can't function. Oh no. Is it the holidays? Is that, is that getting to you? I, I, I sit and look as if you're going to answer right away <laughs> as if we're actually talking, we are actually talking, but you know what I mean? One-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Um, sometimes we need it. And let's get into this topic of isolation and maybe it'll help you, Darla. And then if not, keep asking questions and maybe we can touch on something that will. All right. Um, Arrow Girl, I did uh, no contact with my 90-year-old father today. Congratulations on that. I realize it's the trauma bond that I, kept me going back. Oh, deep breath there. That's a tough one. And, and, and that's... Um, yeah, congratulations on that. And I hope that it brings you some relief from the constant uh, negativity and, and abuse. I mean, I know it brings relief from abuse, but I hope that you're able to, uh, it is very painful. And it is very hard to break trauma bonds, especially, you know, after that many years, right? <laughs> it's a long, long, a long stretch. Okay. Um, didn't realize the topic was isolated. It's okay. We can talk about anything for a little bit. Makes criticizing. What are you saying? I missed part of you. Hi, Grace. I missed part of what you're saying here, Grace. We can just jump in. And then a question about teaching my 16-year-old daughter to be strong, voicing her boundaries with her dad. Around family and friends, he pushes her boundaries by not listening to her requests to stop things. 
and makes criticizing jokes in front of everyone. She's sweet and says to stop, but he doesn't listen to her and hurts her feelings later on. It is so hard, Grace, because what can you do? It didn't work with an adult telling, you know, with us telling them and it, and for a child, you know, even a teenage child, it, it's so teaching her that her father has his own issues with listening to people that she's not alone in being the only person he does this to and that dealing with him might mean as minimal um, requests or need meeting as possible and to, and to find healthy ways to get her needs and be heard and um, with people who are safe. And <clears throat> there is not much you can do to, you can be direct you can make them think it's their idea. You can um, minimize contact. You can minimize the situations where there's going to be an issue. And I don't know the types of things he's doing. Um, clearly speaking up to him makes him react in a narcissistic tantrum by telling jokes in front of everyone and um, criticizing her. So um, speaking up might mean doing it a little less or doing it and then just letting him tell the jokes. You know, people see that and think what a jerk, right? She has to understand, hopefully, that people see him and and think, why would he say that to his daughter who's so sweet, you know? Um, not taking it personal, it's so hard. It's your dad, right? Not taking it personal. Um, getting her in some therapy if possible so that she can understand this isn't her, that she has, um, really teaching her what narcissism is at, at an age appropriate uh, with age appropriate words and age appropriate descriptions. And you know, your child, so you know what would, what that would mean to her, right? We're all different and some children can handle more younger and others. Right. So I think that's, that's what I got for that. I'm sorry. That's happening. I hate hearing that stuff. I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad we have a place to hear it, but I hate that it happens. All right. Um, my ex left a box of belongings on my step one year from when, oh, right, right. Get rid of it. Do you need it? Is it his, is it um, getting him, was that a Hoover? Yes, that's a Hoover. They keep things on purpose so they can throw them back later or they find them and they think, and they just storm away and then one day they drop them off. Yes, it's a Hoover. Hoovers are best just to go, they go no contact with it if it's, if it's memorabilia and stuff you don't need, get rid of it. You know, if it's things you want, then just be like, fine, it's back, whatever. Try and get rid of the box it came in. Um, you, we have to kind of move through the who move through the triggers and not let the triggers, the why and the what's happening and what does this mean and all of that. It's a Hoover. It's always a Hoover when they contact you again. And, um, Go back to doing well. You were doing well and you can do well. You're saying I was doing well and now I feel stuck. Totally, I get it. And that happens. So it's try and focus on the self-care and come back to what was helping you feel good. Just jump back in to the, feel, to the things you were doing. Um, that's the kind of isolation that is not healthy for you, right? When we shut down because of a trigger and we shut down because of uh, the Hoover's, it's, it takes strength. You can do it. Get back into the things that make you feel good. Find your power again. It's just, it's a sort of knocks your, it sort of pulls the rug out from under you, right? So you just got to like stand up and brush it off and move on. And Hoovers are uncomfortable and they're triggering and they, um, they do bring up a lot of stuff. 100 days, no contact. Excellent. And you're doing it. This is what it's like. It's ups and downs. We pick ourselves back up and we get back on the self-care and get back on the things that actually helped to improve things. So go back to whatever it was that helped you in the first place, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, maintaining boundaries is the best way to maneuver a Hoover. It, it is maintaining boundaries and then telling yourself, okay, I feel this. It's okay. I feel this. This is triggering. This is what a trigger feels like. And like, where is it in your body? Like, if, if I have a trigger, I feel um, anxious, I feel nervous, I start shaking, you know, all the things I'll just notice, and I'll say, whoa, I'm super triggered. Okay, well, 
I guess I have to feel triggered right now, but that doesn't mean I have to think about it and, and go into it because there's nothing more to think about. This person's out. They don't deserve to be in my thoughts even. You know what I mean? So it's talking yourself down and back through it, hopefully. Um, let's see. What are we saying here? They're bloody sneaky. They can see from the outside of it now. Observation. Yes, indeed. Um, what's the? I want to hear her address. What's the difference in an inverted narc and a codependent? Both love to control. <sighs> inverted narc. I, I always have a hard time wrapping my brain around that term. I need to look it up again because for some reason I, I don't get the term. I don't know why. <laughs> That's like the one term I'm like, what? How is, ex tell me the definition. If you, someone looks it up and just posts it here and then I can answer it. I, I know, I know what it is. I just can never like attach that to a memory place in my brain. <laughs> All right. Um, Lise, what do you do when your golden child adult sibling is moving in to Bogart elderly mom's estate and have me taken off the will, even though I took care of mom for decades alone, you get the legal action involved. Um, you, so mom is still around, right? Remind me what's happening here, Bonnie. Uh, moving in with mom. Yeah. Elderly mom's estate. Okay. So she's moving in now you get things put in, in legal terms now and you, um, Oh, that's so tricky. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I can answer that off the top of my head. I'd have to think about strategies. You're going to have to strategize that one. How to keep it legally. Well, she's taking over everything. Mom's complicitly and brainwashed. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Bonnie, let me think on it um, because it's, I don't want to give you wrong information here or, or, you know, advice on something that's so tricky. <sighs> I'm sorry. This is a hard one. Okay. Um, would an inverted narc be another name for, hi, H1, Anna, uh, another name for a covert narcissist? Mo Cowboy saying the definition is the same as the definition for codependent. They live to control others as, but what makes it called it? That's what always confused me. Cause what makes it inverted narcissist versus codependent? Like what, what in the definition? I can't look it up while I'm here. So um, subtype covert narcissist, the inverted narcissist is a codependent who depends exclusively on narcissists. Narcissist codependent. Okay. Well, I guess that's what it is. <laughs> That makes sense. That's why I don't get it. So is, yeah, I, I need to, that one's confusing me. Sorry. Now I'm all stumped. <laughs> I don't know. know. Um, yeah. Codependents say they can heal change by their actions. So it's a person that's depending on narcissists exclusively to get their needs met. That would take a lot of self-observation and work to get oneself into therapy enough to find a way to take care of yourself, right? Uh, yeah. Um, this weekend I had to text my ex. He was being an ass. I said, I said, I can't, can't we be cordial? Nope. He said, because of what I said and did after he left, there is only hate. Oh my gosh. I hear the tiny violins all around his shoulders. Don't you? Because of what you did, there is only hate. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not trying to make light of that situation, except it is ridiculous that people cannot just be civil adults. But <sighs> it's not because of what you did. It's because of how they are. Such a typical response. I was told if I cross the bridge, if I cross them, I could never come back. And I thought, where is the bridge? <laughs> right? Okay. If I cross them. All right. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's awful to deal with. You just got to let them go and, and know that you can't be civil. And so be businesslike. Yes. No. Here's the information that you needed. 
may I please have the information back that I needed? Thank you very much. Goodbye. I mean, that's all you can do. You can't be civil and um, you can gray rocket to the point of absolute business transaction and that's it, right? I've heard today that a narcissist is also codependent. I, okay, let's talk about the word, let's talk about labeling, <laughs> okay? First of all, we can't label anyone a narcissist, right? Because we're not professionals who can diagnose people. We can say they have traits that are, they're behaving like narcissists. We can say that they are certainly have enough traits where it looks like NPD. And we can definitely say it's toxic when someone treats you a certain way and has certain characteristics and behaviors in the way that they operate in a relationship. We can definitely say that's toxic. Is codependency toxic? Sure, it can be, right? The difference is the reason that we need, we, we want so bad to know that there are narcissists is because we so want our partners to change. We want to know it's not our fault. We want to know that we are um, not responsible for the things that are going on because if we are, we could try and fix them. And we spend so many years trying to fix them, taking on the responsibility of the narcissist. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about in a minute when I get to the other topic. But it's so understanding that a person has no empathy or viewing their uh, actions and seeing and witnessing the lack of empathy. It's all we need to know. Okay. Now, are they codependent? They're needy. They're not codependent. They don't do things to um, people please. Okay. Codependent is a term, as far as my understanding goes, that was linked with addiction, right? So somebody who is a partner of an addict. It has now been tr also used in the narcissistic recovery world for people that enable narcissists. So codependent people enable the addict to continue their behavior without taking accountability. That's why the toxic relate that's why that relationship is toxic to both people because if if you have an addict and they really would like and they really um, could get help, somebody enabling them is not going to allow them to get the help they need because it requires accountability. But we know narcissists don't take accountability. So take the addiction part out of it and just talk about narcissistic abuse and you've got and you've got somebody who can't take accountability, who won't take accountability, refuses to take accountability. They push everything back behind their egotistical mask and do not accept responsibility or accountability. So you've got somebody enabling them. Now, a narcissist is not that. That isn't how they operate. They operate by, they may people please in the sense of give you what you want when they love bomb but everything is transactional tit for tat. You know, I do it to get something back. That's different than doing it to receive love. So a lot of times codependent, codependent I say in quotes because I don't personally like it as a label for people who are in narcissistic abusive relationships because the narcissistic abusive relationship sets up this pattern. So pretty much anyone who's with a narcissist, unless they are just going at it all the time, head to head, fighting. And, you know, mostly that doesn't work for a narcissist for too long. So people always become enabling of narcissists because narcissist requires it. I was told I require your devotion. I require your, what did it, your service? I require your service. Require it. Okay. That's what they are. That's how they are. So, Back to the question, can a narcissist be codependent? I don't, unless they're a, a, like a lower level on the spectrum narcissist and they're dealing with a more toxic narcissist, like maybe it's a someone really low where they don't really have NPD, they might have some empathy or maybe it's no empathy, but they're kind of a low, lower on the spectrum narcissist and they're dealing with a malignant narcissist. Say, yeah, they, maybe they are codependent in that situation. Okay, but that's just a ranking more more like it. It's not that they're doing it from the same place because they don't. It's all about their own egotistical mask wearing game, right? Okay, so did I miss anything? Okay, intent is defining factor. Yes, is the term codependent in the DSM? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's a... Um, it's not a it's not a 
codependent disorder. It's not, it's not a, you know, it's not a um, personality disorder. It is, a. Uh, my understanding is it is a series of behaviors that are linked to a belief system that, that create the behaviors, right? So if I believe the only way someone will love me is if I cook them meals and do everything for them, then I'm being, co- I'm being, I'm enabling and I am people pleasing. I prefer the term people pleasing personally because um, yeah, because I was taught that <laughs> from a therapist. So I don't know. That's how I look at it. Um, whereas codependency is, but we do, we, 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 so here's the thing. The one we're going to talk about today, which is one of the questions was, I'm going to go to this question because it was asked and then, and then I'll come back to you guys. Um, wait, wait, I want to pop that on. Okay. I need someone modding in here for me so I don't have to do that. Um, they rage if you ask for accountability. Yes, they do. Here's one for y'all. My ex created fake dating profiles and clicks on my profile two years later. Her profile is written to remind me of our interests. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. It's a good old catfish, right? (sighs) Okay. Um, The disease to please. I like that. I don't like that, but you know, I like the phrase. I'm so lonely or isolated and fear-based that I have found aspects of them attractive. Exactly. We have to understand what it is that we're attracted to, to help us not be around it. Okay. So question was how to ensure that you are um, being heard without being mean or um, mean without being mean. So how to ensure you're being heard without being too much, being mean, right? And when does tiptoeing around someone feeling become enabling? So to define enabling, since we're on, help us. (laughs) You help me help you. Let's help each other. Okay. Um, All right. So let's talk about our, our, our end of this, which is the enabling factor, right? So, so say you're, you're out, you're you're realizing you're being too isolating or you're you're trying to make friends or whatever and you're you have a situation where you have a group of people and you're talking and and you realize you have to say something to one of them that isn't positive it is maybe a critique a criticism something you need to say that you're not happy with something that it needs to be done something right and there's a big strong part of you that wants to just do it for them He wants to just take care of it and not have to deal with talking to them. But you know you need to talk to them because you need to confront the situation and and be accountable to what's happening in the dynamic of whatever it is. So, and then at the same time, you don't want to come across really direct and blunt and mean because, you know, people might take it a certain way. And and sometimes they do. Okay. So so let's define enabling. It's um, always feeling... It's always fixing, solving, or making the consequences go away for someone else, okay? Often we do it because we're not talking about addiction. We're talking about doing this in an emotional way with someone being emotionally abusive. We often take the responsibilities for the other person's emotions, and we try and manage it down by not speaking directly by overthinking situations and trying to control it from that aspect. I feel like a lot of enabling is to protect oneself. It's to keep yourself safe from the consequences of what will happen if you don't do the enabling. Because when you're with a narcissist or any toxic person, you have somebody who every time you speak directly, every time you speak, even the most politely worded direct comment about something that needs to be said, you are, you're attacked, you're gaslighted, you're, they talk around you, somebody might, they get threatened, they get their feelings hurt, they get, they are completely, they can't just take accountability for the thing, they can't say, oh, I hear you, oh, okay, 
and you know what could I do differently or or they can't talk about it they can't they can't own their own piece of it no because they're toxic and so they'll throw it back at you they'll project they'll give you they'll become victims they'll all that stuff happens right and so we're so used to that that then trying to go back out into the world and talk to people oh that's super scary and and so we're enabling we're being enablers or we're being people pleasers not because we want that person to really like us. We're doing it because half the time, by the time we're here, we could care less if anyone likes us. <laughs> we just want, we just want peace, right? We just want peace. We don't want to deal with what's going to come. And we don't know what's going to come. That's the thing. We don't know until we do it. And then we deal with the person as they are in the moment. Okay. So um, you almost get sucked into the, yeah, the culty thing based on fear. Yeah, it's right. That was totally me when I was with him. But see what happens then when when Christy or anyone who is responding to this, uh, when we are now not with them or when we are dealing with people that we don't believe are narcissists, right? Friends and coworkers or whatever, we still we still have that same. It's like a a, a you know a, a learned behavior on how to then relate to people that isn't exactly healthy. So say you have to tell someone something, how you do it. Right. So I think it's practice. If somebody said practice socializing to make it more comfortable. Yes. Yes. Practice socializing to make it more comfortable. It's not comfortable to speak directly to people. And we do get clumsy and we do get too direct and we do get too harsh sometimes right at first because what we're learning is boundary setting. Right. So as we're setting boundaries for what we tolerate, what we won't tolerate, what is acceptable, what is where we where we want for our lives. Right. We're setting boundaries. It can be uh, clumsy and, and it can be it, it can make people mad and it can cause problems. People don't like it, especially if they know you. So I have been staying away. We're going to talk about that, Christy, in a second. The isolation. That's the next piece to this. I jumped in, I went ahead to the afterwards when we're back to talking to people ahead because of the way chat was going. So, um, okay. Yeah, so we're doing this to protect ourselves, right? And I think when we are doing it to be, when we are speaking to someone, back to the question, how do you ensure that you're being heard? without being mean and not and not tiptoeing around at the same time. It's your intent. What is your intent? My intent is to be heard. What is your intent for the whole situation? It's for that person to also be heard. It's to give them space to have to either fix the situation or understand the situation. How can you be heard if you're going at someone uh, just from putting what you happened to you on the situation without seeing their side of it. So you employ your empathy to help you see the other person's side of things, the bigger picture, and then speak from there. And then you're then you're kind of watching out for someone's position, right? Instead of, okay, because boundary setting, I think sometimes, I think the question was, how do I set a boundary without being harsh? How do I set a boundary without being, especially, coming from someone who potentially is an INFJ, <laughs> it can be even more uh, direct and more, we just, enough's enough. And we do have a way of wording things sometimes that it's, that is off-putting to other people just because it's sort of like cut to the chase, just get to the bare bones of what's the matter. Here it is, fix it. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. I just want this fixed. <laughs> right or or don't do this thing or or this thing is upsetting whatever so okay um i didn't go in a group i didn't go in a group what i meant was oh, oh i'm sorry I'm, I'm halfway through here i made myself go to the gym with people twice a month twice this month it was i was awkward and didn't do much but i got out with people lessening the isolation it felt good afterward good excellent how do you deal with a narcissist um can hi can how do you deal with a narcissist who uses tools for healthy relationships as weapons thank you that is an excellent question oh my gosh yeah i feel ya totally 
this is why don't go to therapy with them. This is why don't tell them what you're learning, what you know. Giving them tools for healthy relationships is is it's giving them arsenal, isn't it? Yeah. So how to deal with it? You gray rock. You gray rock it. Um, boundaries that are stipulated as control instead of boundary. Can you say a little more about that? Um, more specifically, so I can answer that he has learned through corporate seminars. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. It's nothing you can control, right? They, they have the freedom to the information just like everybody else. And they learn. And the clever, covert, more sometimes the more cerebral types and sometimes the more altruistic types of covert narcissists in particular. Oh, how they love to use that information that they learned against you. So you gray rock it. I mean, the best thing is, right, get away from them. That's the that's the best way to deal with it is to don't deal with it. Don't deal with them. If you can't get away or you're not ready to get away, then you gray rock it. You don't react to it. He uses communication tools to control interactions. Shuts me down rather than using skills as end tools. Uh-huh. This is exactly. And then and then they throw it at you as if it's a misuse of the of the communication tools, right? I think I understand, I totally feel what you're saying and I'm not speaking to it maybe clearly, but yeah, you gray rock it. You don't react to it. As an example, they might, um, tell me if I'm wrong here, like um, they might say, you, you say, you know, this is what's going on and, and I'm so upset by this and you know, I don't, I, I would, this really hurt me and they say, I hear you. That must be difficult. And that's it. So they're using a communication skill of um, nonviolent communication or something. And it means nothing. It shuts you down. Basically, they, and then they say, I heard you. When you say, okay, so can we talk about this? They say, we did talk about it. I told you I heard you. And that's it. Boom, silent treatment starts or whatever. Then they, they flip it to some, or they gaslight, or they project, or they, or they, flip the script and throw back at you the thing that you did, that they did as if you did it, you know, they do the whole thing and they use the, they say, you know, every time I listen to you, every time I tell you, I heard you, it's just not enough. It's not enough. And then they storm off and now all of a sudden you're sitting there worse than you were before you even started the situation, before you even started the conversation. So you just don't go into those conversations. You avoid them and you gray rock the heck out of any time they, you, when you know what's happening, you tell yourself, oh, they're using that skill. Uh-huh. Here comes the gaslighting that goes along with it. That's what they're doing. And inside that's you just start watching it. And then the outs on the outside, you just, you know, what are you gonna say? Nothing. There's nothing to say because it's all a game. It's not real communication. All right. Um, I don't think inverted narcissist is in the DSM. I think that no, I don't think I think narcissistic personality disorder obviously is, but I don't think inverted narcissist is. I think it's a term created to understand behaviors. Okay. Um, also set boundaries to control rather than healthy relationship interaction. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. It's all, it, and getting away really is the way to deal with it. Honestly, there's no, you can't push back on that without a, without a fight. Right. It's not, um, it becomes a game about manipulating one another, doesn't it? All right. Um, the public is so mean. I know we live in a narcissistic culture. Why do I still expect people to be good? There are good people. There's lots of good people. People on the whole, the, the society on the whole, I think we just kind of have to do what we can to be good people in the life that we're living and hope that that ripple effect affects other people through our own goodness, right? Expecting it to come back to us because of that, I, I'm i still looking for that answer, <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, so I don't know that I answered this. Did I? I think I did, okay. When we did text Saturday, he said I was going back on the blocked list, yet message always shows delivered. He's never blocked. I don't get it. He's he's controlling you with toxic words to just to piss you off. He's just trying to upset you. 
That's all it is, Christy. He's just trying to control. He's trying to stay in control. You're you didn't do what he said, so now you're on. Now you're over with the pawns he uses as negative supply, and so he'll just keep feeding the negative supply, right? Until something happens and he needs you as positive supply, and then if that ever happens, who knows? Don't wait around for it. Um, can you switch to email and not text him? Can you switch everything to email so you're not so it's not on your daily awareness? Does that make sense? Like email, you have to actually open and check for the most part. I'm sure you can get alerts, but it's different than texting, where texting is very immediate and it creates a anxiety. Texting in general is has a wonderful ability to access people so readily. And it also has an expectation that that person will reply. So, and if they don't, and we can sit and see it, it, it just creates like too much anxiety. So if you can switch a narcissist over to email, that's I think is better. All right, gray rocking didn't always work for me. He would be emotionless and silent for hours, walk away in zero effect or words. It's not a meant to, it's not meant to work to change them. It's meant to help you not attach to the situation as much. So my personal tip for gray rocking is to really know your intent on the inside is your own. In other words, you say they're say they're gaslighting you. Say they're in the middle of something that makes their word salad is gone so crazy you don't know what, know what you're arguing about anymore. You know you feel like crying. You know you feel like screaming. You know you feel like losing it. You just you don't know what's happening anymore coming out of their mouth. But you can identify that as gaslighting, right? So you tell yourself, okay, calm down. I'm not going to engage with this. That is gaslighting. I don't engage with gaslighting. You don't say that out loud. That's in the inside. It's the intent on the inside that you keep yourself strong with, that that's where the gray rocking to me is most effective. Doing it as an external thing. Oh, I'm supposed to do this. And inside you're going, why, 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 why won't they listen to me? Oh my gosh. Oh no. Now they're doing this. Oh, now they're doing that. And you're like freaking out and worried about them. That isn't helping you per se. It might help a little bit in some situations where it's like once or twice. But when you live in a situation where you're having to gray rock often, at least until you can get away from it, or you're trying to figure out how to get away from it, or if you even want to get away from it, you have to remember on the inside that you're separate from them. You're, um, what you feel is legitimate and real. And so you tell yourself, my side of this is real. Whatever they're talking about is gaslighting. I'm not even listening to it. Does that make sense? That's to me how gray rocking is most effective. It's keeping the real stuff that you want to be yelling at them. You want to, you want to be defending yourself. You want to be um, telling them what you feel. You want to be, you want to be engaged in an actual conversation with another adult, right? But you can't be because they're great. They've gone into their narcissistic loop. Um, I couldn't, I could be silent and un, unemotional forever. Me. It often made things worse. <laughs> well, yeah, it makes it worse. It's not comfortable. It's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be a lifestyle. It's a tool to help you when you have to deal with them. Does that make sense? When you use gray rock as a lifestyle, it totally can feel like you're shutting down. It can feel like you're never being heard. It can feel like it's backfiring in your own face because you're never able to express yourself to that per to the very to the person you want so much to express yourself to. You can express yourself. You can go to therapy or coaching or friends or whatever and talk about what happens. So you do you are heard in other areas of your life. It's just with that one person, with that toxic person that when we, we feel like we need it the most and we feel like we need them to help us rectify the problem because we're trauma bonded to them because that's the trauma bond cycle, right? We're, we're stuck in a state when we're gray rocking and we're over and over and over and over with a narcissist. We're stuck in that state of um, no resolution, which means no oxytocin. It means none of the chemicals that we need as part of that trauma bond cycle to give us the relief. We're not getting any crumbs right? Once we get the crumbs, it starts over again, and we feel better, we get the surge of relief, everything is well for about five minutes, and then it's back again. So <laughs> it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be a lifestyle, it's meant to be a, a, a skill in your back pocket for when you need it. 
Does that make sense? Okay. We're not supposed to be in their world. No, we're not. Okay. Um, it's lonely and being constant impoverishment means in a relationship with a narc. Ugh. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Excuse me. I didn't mean to cough it. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about isolation a minute or a few minutes because that was the main topic today that I never got to. All right. Um, all right. So, which is fine because I like active chat too. Actually, I like it a lot. Okay. So, isolation. When is it healthy to be alone versus isolating oneself? Was asked. When is what is the difference between being alone, choosing to be alone, alone time, taking time away, going into a state of hibernation, sort of, right? When is that healthy versus isolation? So, when you're with a narcissist, so much of your life, or all of your life, is for them, right? Slowly but surely, you lose yourself. Sometimes rapidly, you lose yourself. Actually, pretty rapidly, you lose yourself often because of the massive love bombing in the beginning. You lose who you are. You lose your... Um, <clears throat> Right, when it starts impacting us negatively. But more than that, I think what can happen when we are choosing to be alone a lot, um, some people run the risk of depression from that. Some people run the risk of it becoming an unhealthy pattern for themselves, especially if before the narcissist, they never were a person that did that and they had a happy existence, right? If they were never a, per a person that never spent time alone, and they felt kind of miserable all the time, that'd be different. But if they were, you know, they enjoyed their interactions with friends, they enjoyed being out in the world, they enjoyed, you know, doing things, and now they're not doing anything. So they can run the risk of like, but at the same time, they feel like they just can't, or they don't want to do anything, they can run that risk of like not having enough balance. And I think that's a lot of us, a lot of people. Um, so I'm not talking about just being alone, I'm talking about really, you know, going in and isolating and um, anyway, so let's keep going. Um, so I, what I said here is taking a lot of time solo is often super needed. It's needed so much by people who have been in toxic relationships. We need to take that time to remember who we are. We need to rediscover ourselves or discover ourselves if you've had a toxic parent or toxic upbringing. <laughs> Excuse me. And we need to often do that on our own. And we're drained and exhausted and tired. And just going to work is hard enough, right? So that's one part of healing, right? In the beginning or, or even a little later when you just are worn out. And, and they are, narcissists drain you of more than just emotional energy. They drain you of physical energy. They drain you of spiritual energy. They drain you of your sense of self. So it takes a while to get back to where you're feeling like even being around people because people are tiring at that point. And sometimes you might get a little bit of energy from being around people, but then quickly it's just like, it does the opposite and you're more drained. Yeah, so um, what are we saying here? I think, what did Grace say? I don't mind being on my isolation 90%. Well, yeah, exactly. And it's okay, it's okay. But for some people that can start to become a pattern that then, creates a very isolated life that then they then they wake up one day and go, oh, what did I do? <laughs> Why like, now I don't know how to be around people or is, is this, is this, I did, did I do it too much? Or, you know, um, I've heard people suddenly, you know, get really depressed again, and realize, oh my gosh, I've been in isolation. So to me, there has to be, you know, have to be anything, but to me, some finding some sort of balance with it is, can be important. Um, the holidays are making you sad. The holidays are hard. You're not alone there, Bonnie. It is, yeah. So I'm gonna isolate Christmas day and don't wanna be with my toxic family. Are you gonna isolate or are you gonna be alone? Make the, making the, okay, so maybe there's, there's a way we can talk about it that is I am choosing solitude versus I'm isolating. <laughs> isolating makes it um, feel like you're closing yourself off from the world versus a choice to be with, a very important person yourself, right? And like I said, it takes us time to get to know who that person even is. And so sometimes being alone a lot is desired. Um, what they said was, 
that they can't wait to get into their PJs after work. Like, and that just made me think, oh, that is your self-comforting. That's your self-care. That's, that's you seeking the comfort you need at the end of the day. That's your big hug, right? And so why is that bad? It's not bad. That's a good thing. It's okay. Now, I can't wait. It's, it's in the attitude. It's in your inner, your intention for yourself. If your intention is, oh my gosh, I, I got to get away from people. Everyone, everything's driving me crazy. I'm overwhelmed. Maybe there's something there that then needs working on, right? But if it's, my gosh, I can't wait for my PJs. <laughs> that's a totally different attitude, right? So if it's bringing you joy in your solitude, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't, I really don't. I think if it's when we're, I can't get out of my PJs. I, I just need to be alone. You know, that's, you see what I'm saying? Totally different attitude. Then sometimes we do need to enforce getting around other people. Yeah, right? It's when you're, what Jack said it simplest, <laughs> when you're not happy and when it's no longer, when it's no longer positive to be by yourself. Um, hi, Joe. What are we saying here? Okay. Um, anything else you guys have? And I think it's sometimes when you are alone and you are and you spend enough time alone and you start to get to get to know yourself differently. You get to know different parts of the way you think and the way you feel about things and the way just yourself, what you even like, what you want to do. You might find that you're then attracted to different things, different types of people, um, different experiences, and you may find other people who also enjoy being in that solitude and you can share the solitude together. Also, if you are in any form of group coaching or group therapy or anything where you're with a group of people, you're not alone, right? When we are going through recovery from narcissistic abuse and we're reaching out when we're on support groups, when we're in group coaching in particular, where um, we are talking a lot, I mean, therapy as well, but I'm speaking experience wise, we're talking a lot about ourself. We're sharing intimate details of how we think and feel our problems, our struggles, our grief, our sadness, our joys, our happiness, what's what's working for us, what isn't working for us. We're sharing so much of ourself with people. That can be enough sometimes for a little while to feel like you just had way more social interaction than you've had in a long time because you're used to sharing all of this stuff with someone toxic and someone toxic isn't actually listening to you when you have someone truly listening to you and you have someone caring about your well-being and trying to help you uh, focus your life on the way you want to just like be there while you do the focusing and while you asking you the questions and you know being present to you that that's a lot of socializing for an introvert especially right so it can be it can feel like that's enough <laughs> for a little while. And um, that's okay. So no, you're not alone when you're doing stuff like that. Why does my phone keep dinging? All right. Um, okay. Yay, the group. Uh, thinking of seeing if the local shelters need volunteers. Hi, Violet. I missed you coming in. Where did you? You said hi up here. I'm going back and forth about going to family dinner. Closer it gets, the more anxious I feel. Not going will most likely cause some backlash. I'm So why can't we take the backlash, but we can take the abuse? That's always my question to myself. Why can't I take the backlash of people being disappointed with me, but I can sit and take the abuse? <laughs> right? It's just a different negativity. One is a choice to, in, to not engage and allow other people their negative toxic feelings. The other one is enabling the toxic feelings, really. It's enabling them to be, to do whatever they want, right? So sometimes when we're learning that boundary and we're learning to place, to, to make a decision of where we want to choose to place, put our time and where, who we want to spend our time with and, and knowing that there's going to be a backlash, we're not responsible for other people's feelings. We're not responsible for their reactions to us. We're not. If we are polite and kind, that goes back to the first topic of how to do, how to say these things, how to set a boundary in a way that isn't um, offensive, so to speak, right? Direct, simple, stating your needs. Um, 
I need to be alone this year. I, I will miss you guys. Thank you for inviting me. That's all they need to know. They can make any conclusion they want after that point. You've said nothing offensive, right? They can be as mad as they want and it's not your responsibility. Does that make sense? So, okay. And it's hard and it's uncomfortable. And I think it is practice. It's a lot of practice with being uncomfortable with other people's reactions to us. Yeah. If I had my own place, it wouldn't be an issue. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, I live with the family at the moment. I will be punished. Okay. Yeah. That's different. That's different. So can you limit the time? Can you make an excuse to get out of the time, can it, to get out of part of it? If you're, like you said, if you're volunteering and this is something I've wanted to do, I thank you for supporting me in this. I know that it will help a lot of people. Thank you for supporting me in this. Right? Okay. Oh, they're so difficult. Um, your feelings about your own isolation. Okay, Robin, we'll, we'll hear yours. Um, in relationship, I wanted to avoid judgment for staying or going back. I'm going to wait till your second part. Um, my dad, Grace is saying my dad and my stepmom will be angry when I tell them I'm not bringing my kids to Christmas because we are going to be with my dying mother. I tell myself I am not responsible for their feelings. That's right. You're not. So Robin is saying in my relationship, in the relationship, I wanted to avoid judgments for staying or going back out. I want to avoid judgments for feeling like I do. I do for going back. I'm not understanding. So you're saying that, wait, wait, wait. This is regarding your isolation. The two words that I'm seeing there is avoid. <laughs> the, 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 so the one word I'm seeing in both is avoid and judgment. Two words, I got it. <laughs> two words, avoid and judgment. I would, if I were you, Robin, if I were talking to you, I would, where I am talking to you. I'm sorry. It must be. I did hit the 50 minute mark. Here we go. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to 2020. I'm going to pass the 50 minute mark without stopping and freezing. Okay. Um, okay. Who's judging in who, who is inside of you judging? Who's doing that judging? You're wanting to avoid judgment from other people, right? But is the bigger judge inside yourself about what you, what you think and feel? And if so, what questions can you ask yourself to uh, look at that belief and start to learn to disbelieve it? That you, I mean, what are you telling yourself, basically? Okay. Um, I have a three-year-old. She can either help or hinder the isolation. I feel it pulls me out if she's being a, a three-nager, then drags me back. <laughs> right? Yeah. All right. Um, isolation. Time alone does not have to be isolation. Let's put it that way. Time alone well spent is not isolation. Time alone where you feel imprisoned because you're alone. That feels like isolation. Time alone where you're spending it doing the things you want to do, taking care of your own needs. Um, it can get lonely, sure, but it's not isolation. Does that make sense? That's just choosing solitude. And it's not a bad thing. Finding balance if you feel the depression coming on, if you feel, um, so maybe it's having um, things lined up that you could do, should you choose. You know, oh, here's some social events I could choose to partake in if I want to. I don't have to. I feel like being alone. That's okay. But, you know, and, and that maybe that is a way to, to find some balance so that you're not tipping into um, isolation and depression. Does that make sense? That's one way I could think of off the top of my head. Okay. Um, anything else you guys have for today? I'm not sure I covered that as well as I <laughs> do, but that's okay. Well, we can come back to it. All right. And when, what are we saying? When I don't feel well and the solitude isn't comfortable anymore, I go volunteering. Exactly. Finding something. You have something that you can do that alleviates that feeling when it becomes, it feels like, to me, like a, like a, 
imprisoned in the loneliness, right? Or imprisoned in isolation versus just getting out in the world. Okay. Um, clearly, I'm having a hard time typing my thoughts today. Have a good night. Oh, no, I think it's me, Robin. I, I have a hard time when when with multiple topics all um, going and trying to understand exactly what someone's meaning specifically. Um, you're saying that you let me go back and read this. I'm gonna try Let me try this one more time, Robin. In relationship, I wanted to avoid judgment for staying or going back and out. I wanted to avoid judgments for feeling like I do for going back. And so, and so then what? So then you isolate in order to tell me the conclusion of that. I feel like I'm missing one little piece there for my understanding. It's a lot easier with words, isn't it, than typing <laughs> sometimes? Okay. Um, try living in your own home and doing with your, let's see. Oh, hi, Belle. Okay. All right. Tell me what, what's the piece I'm missing here, Robin, that, that, to understand you. Okay. Um, you're guilted for not, and punished for not having the perfect Christmas. Yeah, well... Oh, I can't we all just be nice, right? Simpler, so much simpler than drama. <laughs> all right. Okay, you guys. So anything else you want to talk about before I head out? What time is it anyway? Yes, before I head out. <laughs> Norman Rockwell Christmas. There's only on cards, right? Yeah, the holidays, okay. We need to talk about the holidays, don't we? We need to do some more. What you guys need? Tell me what you need that would help you for the holidays. Uh, in is what I can give you. Not what I, not what I can't. <laughs> I can't make them fast forward through. I can't. I can't. Uh, you know, fix it. But how? What? What do you need help with in dealing with holidays as they are coming up? I can talk about that. Can we all say hi on Christmas Day for a few minutes? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. How's that? Because then it'll cross over time zones and everything. I will be doing a hangout, I'm sure, for Christmas Day on Span as well. Um, and Christmas Eve. I would like to do something a little different for that and have a little direction with it. I would like to do bring up, bring something to share a short, short three to five minutes poem song, a words of inspiration, something lovely, some gift from your heart, some anything funny, a, five jokes, I don't care. Bring something to share if you want, you don't have to. And then that's the first part. And then the second part, I'd like to just go around the room and any issues that are up for anyone. And I'll do just a quick mini coaching group coaching session at the end for however much time we have left um, just to help get us through the day up. Oh, yeah, I know I heard it. I heard the horn. I heard it. You guys, I totally heard it. You don't need to bark. Totally heard it. Oh, that worked. My baby. Okay. You know what? Drop it guys. Just let it go. Let it go. Redirect. Redirect. <laughs> Sorry. Talking to dogs. All right. Anyway, that's what I'd like to do, which is a little different than just the hangouts, uh, just to have a little more direction and a little more, um, time for people to share what they need to share or talk about what they need to talk about. If you don't want to bring anything, you just want to sit there. Totally fine. If you don't like the idea, they don't come. <laughs> it's totally fine either way. Hi tiger. Okay. Um, yeah. Surrogate family for, for Christmas Eve. Exactly. So we're not in isolation. We have, and you know, yeah. And sharing especially can help with that feeling of isolation. Giving is always a nice way to feel like you're connected to something, right? Okay. Um, oh, the grandbaby. How is the grandbaby? It's Bonnie, sometimes when it's, when everyone's being a jerk, you got to just focus on the positive. That grandbaby can be all of your focus and everyone else can fade into the background like noise, like static, right? And let your focus fall on what is positive. The baby. Hanging out with the baby. Seeing the baby. Talking about the baby. Thinking about the baby. You know, let your focus be on the on the positive through. He's nine pounds. Oh, excellent. 
You know what I mean? Like sometimes we can't fix these broken people around us and we can't fix the broken situation. But if you can find one glimmer of beauty in your day or something amazing like the baby, then put your focus there and let everyone else fade. And if they're asking for your attention, yeah, I don't have any energy or time for you. I'm looking at this sweet little baby. I'm not looking at you. I'm looking where it matters because you're not being you're not being worth my attention right now, frankly, right? So let them be, let them just be and, and focus as much as you can on the positive. Okay, um, all right. Because you have it, you have that built-in positive, right? Because so, yay. Okay, um, I love trees too. <laughs> it's Okay, I know it is. it is very, tough during the holidays. That's why there's lots of support too. So let me out, let me know what you need to hug a tree. Ah, prickly. Um, let me know what you need as far as this goes, as far as talking here goes through the holidays. If you guys have anything, put it in the comment, the main comment section, anything you want me to talk about, we can do that um, as best we can. And like I said, we'll be here at Christmas in some way, shape or form <laughs> here or in a hangout head over to SPAN to get information for that as well. So, okay, if you need to uh, have any information, head over to queenbeing.com for anything regarding narcissistic abuse, recovery, so on. And again, the group coaching is going on all the time. Group coaching is available. You can check out the links in the main description of every video. Um, you can always email me or message me with a question regarding anything. Um, and I guess that's it. If you would like texting notification, text me 33222. Put the word Lease Live, L-I-S-E-L-I-V-E, -E, hit send. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you've not already done so. And the thumbs up. And that's it. I guess I'll see you guys Thursday. And you take care. Talk to you later. Bye.